Uh, here's another thing too, people don't really understand what the cost of living is, LCPI is only 2-3%. No, it wasn't, it was 6.9% in Australia last year. Got up to 9 in the US. Mm. And we'll talk about some of the factors, particularly the most recent budget in a moment, as to the aggravation from that. So let's just round it out and say it's at 7% that it was last year. In order to get ahead financially, your investments, your, your, your return that you require from your investments, just to maintain your purchasing power, what your dollars are worth next year, year after, 7% is now the benchmark return that you have to achieve in order to be at the break even. That's uh, it's a tough prospect. 7% is not that easy. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing show. This week we are tackling inflation, surviving and in thriving through uh, a period of time now which is difficult for many, many people out there. Plenty of things to take out of this podcast. Make sure you take plenty of notes, but as always, please do make sure you take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Laurential. Good to be here, Mr. B. How Thanks, are you, buddy? Man. I'm very well. How are you? Fantastic. In the pink. Good stuff. Now, today, AB, we know out there right now there's a cost of living crisis, mm. high inflation. So today I want to talk about not only surviving, but thriving through these inflationary periods can be done both from an investment perspective and also a personal finance perspective. Yep, inflation, a uh, lifestyle killer, a, a dream crusher, a, a very, very painful experience which for many people has gone from just something you've read in the newspaper to the reality of a quality of life which is which is going through a, um, a, a severe change and I always look at inflation as it starts to bite in three stages. It starts off with the denial phase which is like, ah, this will pass, it's no big deal. Then the damage phase which is where you have to start tightening your belt and cutting your costs and, and, and really looking at lifestyle amongst other things to be able to service the essentials. And then the third phase is the desperate phase, which is a real tragedy if you slide into that. And that can happen when I think inflation is, is more persistent than what people think. A lot of people, when we started to see the cost of living move up in Australia, oh, she'll be right, no problem. Uh, and that's become a, oh my God, moment for them now where it's like, we've really got to start tightening the belt. And if we, if we see another interest rate rise uh, this year, which I suspect we may, um, that, that really is gonna hurt a lot of people. Uh, and oh, it's yeah. very sad to say that. So for our listeners out there, we hear a lot about on the news, CPI, inflation, all these different data points. Can you define for our listeners what is inflation and what do we mean by purchasing power when it gets reduced? So in inflation, in terms of what people understand it to be, is a movement up in, in cost. So something moves from being two bucks a litre for fuel, say, to $2.20. That's a 10% increase. And you can go, well, inflation on fuel is, is 10%. Inflation actually isn't so much that it is the destruction of your personal purchasing power because effectively how inflation um, comes about and what it really means is there's a f finite amount of stuff, let's call it stuff that's available. And if there's more money chasing that stuff, it becomes an auction system. So prices start to move up because there's more money chasing a relatively small or finite amount of goods and services. And that effectively is, is what pushes the price up. So this is actually really important from a practical understanding of inflation because it's not about a percentage move. The actual issue with money or inflation is putting more money in your economy. So if you push more money out there, you will have inflation because there's suddenly a large amount chasing a finite amount of resources. COVID government subsidies on the back of that are really what kick things off for a lot of Western countries, the United States and obviously Australia too, where there's a large amount of government money poured out uh, chasing a finite amount of goods and services. So that's initially what causes it. CPI is the preferred measure, which is the consumer price index, which takes a basket of goods. Imagine a shopping trolley full of all the stuff that you buy. So whether that be uh, electricity or fuel or, or your food at the grocers or clothes or toilet roll or whatever it may be. The stuff to cover. survive, right? The normal stuff. Yeah. And that's then measured uh, on a monthly basis to come up with, okay, how much is the price of that particular basket of goods and services changed over that time frame to give you an inflation rate? And, and really you've got to look at it on an annual basis, where price is at today compared to where they were a year ago. So question for you, Abby, is it the same basket of goods over a lifetime that they measure, does that change? Uh, yeah, good question. It kind of changes a little bit. There are a couple of things that can that can change what's in that basket, and that's there's, 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 there's hedonic changes. So if you've got a, a product that actually has more services with it. So let's take a newspaper, for example. If you get a newspaper, you know, 20 years ago, it was just the weekend newspaper, but now it's full of magazines and, and, and pull-outs and different things uh, that sit in there. 
So from an inflation perspective, the cost of the newspaper may have gone up, but because you're getting more with it, i.e. all these inserts, TV Guide and all that sort of stuff that's in there, it wouldn't be seen as going up in value from an inflation or CPI perspective because you're actually getting more for your money. Now, okay. that's kind of a weird way to look at it because you're paying yeah. more for it, but the same way you're getting more for it, so therefore it's not a like for comparison, so therefore there's no inflation on a newspaper. Interesting, okay. So there, there are some warp things in there, but also the inclusions and exclusions. So, for example, you know, mortgage rates for, or cost of accommodation may not be in there, and it's such a major thing for most people. So question for you, being the Money and Investing Show, higher inflation, which is the environment we're in now, what's the impact on your actual investments, be it property or shares? Look, Inflation affects different asset classes in different ways. If, if you've got a stronger economy where you've got, as we've defined, more money chasing fewer goods, um, companies tend to do quite well in that environment because they have what's called pricing power. You can push prices higher, um, uh, or, or, or if, you, if you don't want to push prices higher, um, you can reduce the size of the good. So if you think about a bar of chocolate or a packet of biscuits or a, a, a bottle of fizzy drink, it comes in a smaller package. And so you don't put the price up, the price stays the same, but you're getting less for your money. So companies have a a pricing power in there, which typically is quite good for share prices because your earnings typically grows on the back of that. So you would ordinarily expect to see the stock market do quite well um, during during a time uh, of of inflation because you've got reasonably strong economic activity. Equally, um, with, with property, you typically see because property is a real asset, there is a physical asset that sits behind it, you would expect to see property do quite well uh, during times of inflation. Why? Because there's more money supplies, there's more money that's out there chasing fewer and fewer goods, therefore prices move higher. Now the antidote to inflation is typically higher interest rates. And higher interest rates are normally synonymous with it's it's more expensive to service a property which quenches demand, which will eventually slow the property market down. But that's not always the case, particularly given some of the factors that we've got here in Australia, where there's a chronic short supply uh, of new dwellings being built, and, and you've got people that's, and, and you've got population growth via immigration chasing it up. So the property market's actually been quite strong, and interest rates haven't dampened that to an extent. It's been pretty painful. A lot of people are struggling to, to keep up with their mortgage, and it may slow them down from moving house and upgrading, but overall, the property market's been pretty robust. So two questions for you. Mm. Let's we look at this two sides. We've got the investment perspective and then we've got ourselves, personal finance. Mm. So if we start with the more simple of the two, let's just say from a personal finance perspective, higher inflationary environment, what does the average consumer need to do to make sure they've got enough money to survive? Yeah, th- th- this is, again, a, a, a bit of a challenging one because when you've got higher interest rates, which is normally goes hand in glove, of course, with, with higher inflation, banks put up interest rates to try and suck that money out of the economy and get it, stopping it from being spent by keeping in savings. When you see interest rates go up, people initially, when they're in that denial phase, go, oh, good, I can save some money here. This is good. I'm getting a high, high rate of interest or higher rate of interest, uh, which, which is good for me. But the challenge is that your purchasing power with that money diminishes. And so you need to have some level of savings. Okay, that's something that's that, that, that's really important, but trying to save because interest rates are higher is, is a misnomer because even though rates have gone up in a year's time, what you're gonna be able to buy with that is is, is actually far less. You give an example, you say you've got 30 grand in the bank account, you're gonna get what, about 14, 1500 bucks worth of interest ballpark for the course of the year. End of the year, you've got 31 and a half grand, look, I'm better off. But you probably need $32,000 in order to maintain the same level of purchasing stuff because it's all gone up in price. So all of a sudden savings is not a good idea even though it feels like it's a good idea because interest rates are higher. So some of the smart things under those sort of circumstances you might do rather than save is take the money and put it in your offset account. I wouldn't pay and overpay the bank off. For example, like principal interest will will get more paid down to get our mortgage down because you may need to redraw that cash at some point and the bank probably won't be too keen to lend it to you under current circumstances. Whereas if you just Chip away with your normal payments and any overpayments you put into your offset account, you're effectively reducing your mortgage, but you still have the ability to access those funds. So that, that to me would be a smarter thing to do than simply saving money. It's the same thing, but put in a different context, I suppose. 
But I think you know you, you you have to buy and own real assets during times of inflation, and we've seen things like gold, for example, run pretty hard, uh, particularly over the last you know six months or so, where um, you know people want to get exposure to the yellow metal because long term it's seen as a better quality store of wealth, uh, and we could open up a whole different economics conversation it's around that. It's a whole that. podcast in itself, I think. But let's just say that typically during times of inflation, you see gold prices move high, which we have, so people are holding physical bullion, for example. Is is a good idea and as we said stocks typically do quite well too yes you've got to tighten your belt uh, to, to accommodate the fact that it's going to cost you if you have a mortgage more to service it but what you choose to do with the money that you have over and how you service that debt I think is key so number one don't necessarily pay off the mortgage in the traditional sense if you've got an offset account pay your normal mortgage and pay the balance in there to get that debt down so you can redraw that cash as and when you need it if you have spare funds get it into Assets which typically perform very, very well during times of inflation, i.e. gold and stocks. And you know, if we look at the last six months out of the S&P or the NASDAQ over in the US, those markets have been absolutely on fire uh, against this. And that's a terrific inflation hedge for you if you can do that. So let's explore that a little further. So mm. getting that money saved and then invested. So personal finance, we've covered that now mm. from an investment perspective. Stock market, why not the property market, as you say, AB? Well, property market, if, if interest rates have moved up, it's not a problem because you can largely pass that on to your tenants. So that you, to, to all intents and purposes, you, you, you're insulated from there. I think if you if you move down the line, I'm trying how to couch this, in terms of becoming more financially literate and understand the reality of how financial markets work, debt is not such a bad thing during times of inflation. Now, the lens that most people would look through is that, hang on a second, why would I want more debt during inflation? It's going to cost me more to service it because interest rates are higher, which is true, and I understand that. At the same time, if you've got, for argument's sake, a million dollars worth of debt today, if inflation is really sticky and is going to be around for the next two, three years, that million dollars, when you come to repay it in five or ten years' time, is going to be worth far less because of that buying power that you have with your money. It works both ways. You, just in the same way as you get compound interest on your savings, you, you can effectively get compound debt reduction based on inflation when you break it back to real terms. So all of a sudden, if you've bought a real asset and you've got a property that's that's moving along quite nicely, let's say, just to put a figure on it, is growing at 7 8% a year, and you've got it covered cash flow-wise by having a good quality tenant in there, then the debt, the mortgage that you might have on that property in real terms in, in 10, 15, 20 years' time is going to be much, much lower for you to pay off. Property's gone up in value. The debt has been discounted by inflation. Happy days. That's a really complicated view of the world Indeed. to have. And it would sit so in contrast with the way that most people would look at the world, which I guess is why most people are broke. But. Got you. So stocks, you say, getting a rate of return, we've got both dividend and capital growth well, potential. Yeah, so, so, so with a stock, so let's start to benchmark it, which I guess is really what you're driving up with the question. So if you've got inflation, here's another thing too, people don't really understand what the cost of living is. Oh, CPI is only 2 3%. No, it wasn't. It was seven. It was 6.9% in Australia last year. Got up to 9 in the US. Mm. So and I, we'll talk about some of the factors, particularly the most recent budget in a moment, as to, as to the aggravation from that. So let's just round it out and say it's at 7% as it was last year. In order to get ahead financially, your investments, your, your, your return that you require from your investments, just to maintain your purchasing power, what your dollars are worth next year, the year after, 7% is another benchmark return that you have to achieve in order to be at a break even. That's it's a tough prospect. Seven percent is not that easy. No, and and if you go down a lot of the traditional routes, so let's take stocks for a moment. So if you're in a, a, a stock that's got a reasonable yield, it pays a dividend twice a year to you, and your yield on that might be say five. Let's say five percent, just to make the maths easy. It could be a little bit more, but let's say five percent. So out of your stock market portfolio, you've got a series of bank shares, for example, that are giving you a five percent yield, but inflation is seven. You're net two percent behind. So you've got to get at least 2% capital gain. I think from memory, the ASX 200 is only up 1.8% over the last six months anyway. So we're, starting to, we're, we're nearly there now at that break even point for the year. Yep. So you've got to get to seven just to maintain your purchasing power. So you've got, say, 5% from dividends. You've got to find another 2% from somewhere else just to maintain where you're at. 
What about costs and tax? Because it costs to transact, Absolutely. it costs to hold uh, stocks. Uh, and we're just talking on a gross basis here, gotcha. not taking into account not taking into account tax. So there's a decent headwind from that that you can see for investors. So you have to be in stocks that are going to give you capital gain. And remember, if you're getting decent capital gain on a stock, let's say the stock's up 30%, that 5% dividend is now on something that's worth 30% more. So it becomes a very, very healthy uh, cash flow return to investors. So you've got to be in those outperforming assets, definitely not in cash. Um, you've got to be in outperforming assets. And the, the other spot that people, I think, sometimes fall foul of is that they might be in a fixed interest portfolio where, uh, and I've had this conversation with my, my father who's retired, he loves bonds, it gives him a nice fixed income, very happy. He's like, oh, I'm getting this, my, my, the yield's gone up, I'm getting this now, which is great. But I said, if you looked at the capital value of your account and also all that extra income you're getting is going in cost of living anyway. And, and when your bond expires in three, five, ten years' time, that lump sum of money you're going to get back is going to be worth far less than what it is today. So holding bonds as an asset class during times of inflation is absolutely crippling. You don't realise that until after the fact. So when you start to see inflation creeping up, that in my mind is a time to be unloading. You don't want to be holding bonds at all through there. Now I've got a pretty decent bond position I'm running at the moment, but I've bought it at where I've seen inflation at the high and bond prices at the low, making bonds really good value so that when interest rates get cut, which is going to be in the US is where I'm trading it, the value of those bonds are going to start really motoring up again. Makes sense. So it's a, a trading philosophy on what most people use as a long-term instrument. Terrible, terrible place to hold money during inflation is fixed interest because you're just getting absolutely butchered. Gee whiz. I mean, there's a lot out there for consumers to... to to consider, not only just themselves, but from their investment perspective, Look, right? I, I'm replaying this conversation as we're having it, and I really, uh, and we try and keep our podcast so it's it's accessible, and, and this is probably quite a meaty... It's high level. ...one to get your head around, but the, 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 the to make... If you want to get a different outcome, you've got to do different things. You've got to learn new stuff. And, and putting it in the, in, in the most simple terms... We're in an environment here in Australia, and I, I trade mostly in the US, so the lens I'm looking through over there is a bit different. We're at probably the top of the interest rate cycle and, and, and things are a little bit different over there. But here in Australia right now, we're in a very, very challenging position where we've got a, an economy which is really on a knife edge, I feel. The our biggest trading partner being China is in that state of economic slowdown. We have got interest rates which are really crippling many middle income families that are really struggling to keep up with the mortgage payments that they have. And we've just had, and we talked about this a number of weeks ago, when Dr. Chalmers delivered his budget, and I said it's a budget for inflation, and we've now started to see that come through with the latest economic statistics. When you have a government that seems hell-bent on throwing subsidies, so if you've got a cost-of-living subsidy, go back to where we started the conversation, which was, if you've got more money chasing fewer goods, you get inflation. So if you say, listen, population, we know you're doing it tough. Here's some money to soften the blow. Now you've got even more money chasing the same amount of goods. You're going to end up with more inflation. So why would a government do that in the budget? Well, it's definitely politically motivated because politics and policy are a crossroads that very seldom meet. If you're helping people on the surface out by giving them more money, oh, they're pretty good, they're helping us out. You know, here's our 300 bucks for our heating. Uh, here's our $19 a fortnight towards our rent. All your landlord's going to do is jack the rent up another $19, so that money's gone anyway. And all you're going to achieve is a situation where you've got higher levels of inflation for a longer period of time, meaning that interest rates have to go up more to try and combat an even bigger inflationary problem. And, and that's the challenge for many, many Australians that are going to be facing over the next three to six months, where just when we look like we had maybe inflation starting to get under control, they're just going to throw another 20 litres of kerosene or petrol on the fire. Oof, up we go. And now we're going to have inflation at higher levels for a longer period of time, almost certainly necessitating a higher interest rate, which is going to bash people that are already struggling to service a mortgage and, and create a bigger pile of misery that you have to put out a bigger subsidy next year if you're consistent with your policies and you want to get re-elected. It's a mess. And sometimes you've just got to take the hard stance and go, look, we need to rein inflation in here. So what we're going to do, it won't be popular, but we're just going to try and remove as much money from the economy as we can, not just through interest rates, but through government spending too. A few cutbacks here and there uh, and just try and get this reined in so that 
ultimately all of us can flourish in a place where the cost of living isn't going through the roof, you've got the ability to service debt and own your own home and have a, a more prosperous future. You're not forced to mega budget in order to just simply survive. But to do that, we've got to take some money out of the economy, not push more in. Now, I'm an economist. I don't happen to have a doctorate in economics, but I've got 35 years of proven history as a pretty decent trader to know how it works. And what we've just articulated there, unfortunately, is the, is the budget sentence that's been inflicted and imposed on the Australian public as a consequence of wanting to throw some cash to chase a finite amount of goods and services. And once you understand that inflation is just more money chasing the same amount of goods and services, pretty hard. Own those goods and services, whether it's through stocks, whether it's through property, whether it's through other real assets like gold, well, you find yourself in a position where you're able to flourish under these conditions. Uh, and unfortunately, the other side of that is a lot of people are also struggling under it. And, and, and this is a this is a difficult conversation because we're talking about where the opportunity sits there, Mitch. And I'm also minded that I spend a good chunk of my time traveling around this country, meeting people week in, week out that genuinely are struggling to make ends meet, where they're selling off different things that they have to try and get their mortgage down or to pay the utility bills or whatever it might be. And it's criminal when the cause of that pain is just being further exacerbated by more government spending to try and garner favour and the long-term ramifications for everyday Australians are really sitting there. And here we sit in the rarefied atmosphere of a podcast studio saying, oh, this is how you make money from this when you've got people on the other side of the coin getting belted is a really morally difficult conversation to have. And that's why I think, you know, being at the, the forefront of investor education as we are to try and help people to say, look, this is what to do, for example, with your mortgage. Get a copy of our book, The Wealth Playbook, and it'll give you some really concrete steps to maybe get a side hustle so you can get a little bit more income coming in that enables you to keep your head above water, how to budget more effectively, to make sure you cut off all the fat if you haven't done that already, to, to try and give you that peace of mind. It, it, it's really hard because there's a huge, huge amount of pain and suffering and unfortunately within there there's also an opportunity and it's not a pain and suffering that we've done anything to create. We're only here trying to provide a solution for people to either try and reduce that pain and or if you're in a position where you can be an investor where to make the right move to really capitalise on it. And all the while, um, we've got our friends down in Canberra that are just like, yeah, nah, we'll just throw some more money at this because that's probably what people want to hear. And all you're doing when you do that is is creating a bigger, more enduring and painful problem for everyday Australians. And they wouldn't necessarily know that because they, they don't necessarily understand some of the economics that we've talked about here today. Indeed. Very difficult situation and, and, and it's and it's visceral. It's so real. You can see it, you can feel it, you can have conversations with people. Yeah, you know, when I'm on the road, Nick and I'll often sit down in the coffee shop and have a chat with someone that's there in the street. Hey, how's it going? What's going on? Oh, yeah, pretty tough at the moment. And when you hear that sort of stuff, and it's grassroots Australians, everyday people, the fabric of our country that are struggling so much right now, and it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't have to be that way. Yet that's what the sentence is that they're having imposed on them. And that's 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 really hard to sit and listen to. And uh, and, I, and, and I do apologise for anyone listening if you're in a tougher position, that we're not these capitalists that are just simply looking to exploit what's going on. We haven't caused what's going on. We're just helping clients traverse that as best we can. But we also understand the pain that you're in and hopefully we can reach out and help you with some of the stuff in our book too. Indeed. Before we cap off, AB, I'd just really like to hear from our listeners if they could comment below ways that they're trying to curb inflation in their life, whether it be through investment or through savings, budgeting, whatever it is. We'd really love to hear from you. So comment below if you're listening right now. Tough one. I really look forward to seeing some of those comments go through and hopefully we can do a, a follow up on this in a little while's time and, and put some more information in there to help people. But I guess the key takeaway is just watch out that higher interest rate doesn't mean you should be saving more. There are better things and more important things that you need to do with your money if you want to outperform inflation, not so you can bank profit, but just simply so you can preserve um, that quality of life that you truly deserve. We're a blessed country and, and we need to get back to feeling blessed as opposed to punished. And uh, that's where a lot of people are right now. Indeed. Thank you, AB. My pleasure. Anytime. There you have it, guys. Please feel free to share this podcast with someone you know that may be struggling, uh, particularly when it comes to that cost of the living. And as, of course, give us a rating and review. Help more people get the show.